any topics you want you need to present uh, please reach out to us and i will hand over to deepak hello everyone thanks for joining the session uh just quick check uh can we do a self in like uh, not a quick check have you ever worked in ml uh, aml field before they're all college students is it okay no no just just to understand the audience that's all uh anyone from in the zoom call are you folks working in aml those fields can i get a raise of hands this is just to, just for understanding the uh, the audience that's it any that's fine all right okay one okay thanks folks uh, all right so a little bit of intro about myself i'm deepak uh, i work in thoughtworks for last five almost five years for that i worked in other areas i'm currently pursuing my mtech uh, in aml so the all the all my learnings i just wanted to share uh, with others also uh, the purpose of this session is to uh, make you curious basically uh, on the ai field uh, and also to understand uh, like internet is actually full of fun memes and everything so just to understand what are this memes talking about so uh, it will not make you experts uh, that's a disclaimer i am just telling you uh, no one uh, no one can make you expert in one hour so uh, with that expectation uh, so uh, let me start so today's session is actually on the classical machine learning algorithms right uh, today's session we will uh, uh, take uh, a lot of algorithms but we will try to deep dive into at least two of them uh, this will actually pave the foundation moving forward like what are the different areas Uh, i am pretty sure like with this actually you'll you'll get an idea of like how, how the aml field works how it is learned all these things so with that let's get started all right uh, so the agenda for today is like i'll just brief a, a little bit of what is ai what is ml what is dl uh, then uh, we'll be focusing primarily on the ml side of things so we'll talk about what are the different types of ml different algorithms again we will not go into each of these algorithms but we will try to deep dive into at least two or not two uh, then we have a case study here uh, which is actually on a financial fraud, uh, fraud detection how it is actually applicable for uh, different uh, different different domains uh, so a lot of banks are actually interested in this kind of area so uh, we'll be having a case study on that and then the last we will have some 10 minutes for question and answers right so uh, what is aa ml and dl so a is actually the just the full forms artificial intelligence which is actually the super set of all uh, it actually makes uh, allows you the pro, uh, these are programs which tries to make uh, a machine very intelligent that is artificial intelligence again a subset of that is called machine learning we'll be focusing more of what is machine learning what are the different algorithms uh, again we will not be uh, dealing with huge data set so if you are dealing with huge data set there is a specific field called deep learning that is actually covers the deep learning models whatever you are uh, learning at this moment right like chat gpt these are actually large models large language models so that actually is an area for nlp uh, deep learning and everything again we will be focusing more of our uh, interest uh, to machine learning at this moment right so uh, a bit of definitions i'm sorry this is actually boring but artificial intelligence is actually the science part to make things smart that's it uh, you can create something like a robotics field uh, anything anything which makes it uh, more uh, rational more intelligent that is the field of ai machine learning is actually an approach to ai uh, in which actually machines tries to predict identify some patterns and that uh, that actually gives it rational capability we will discuss some algorithms how it is done today and again as i said deep learning is actually a field which actually uh, is actually having huge data set like 1 trillion data set 1 billion so again one example i can give you is uh, deep learning is the latest update from meta the llama 3 model that is actually a uh, data set which is actually trained on 1 trillion parameters so it's very not not at all interpretable not at all visualizable so all these areas uh, we focus on the deep learning again at this moment we will only, only focusing on the machine learning aspects for the session right uh, data science is actually a field which encompasses all because everything uh, focuses on the data part fundamentally 
So that is why, again, uh, data science as a field, uh, it does not involve any kind of learning or intelligence. So that's why some, part, some portion of it, it is actually outside. But uh, you get the gist, gist of it. Okay. Yeah. All right. With that, let's get started. Right. Uh, machine learning, like again, uh, as the uh, like the image suggests, it's actually the machines which tries to learn, like how to how to make a machine learn. That's the target for today. Uh, again, uh, the definition of what is machine learning is it's the science uh, science of programming which al allows the uh, machines to learn from learn some patterns, some uh, some kind of uh, actually it's simple enough. It understands some patterns based on some fundamental concepts. And that it, uh, that it gives you its rational ability. So it is that field of study which computers uh, learn without being explicitly programmed. Right. Uh, again, some definitions. I'll skip forward. Right. How it is uh, different from traditional programming. This is one area which I wanted to spend some time. Right. In your college days, you might have learned like traditional programming. You give an input, you have a program. It can be a program, can be a prime number program, binary search program. I don't know if whether still Fibonacci palindrome, all these questions comes. But again, you get the gist of it, how traditional uh, programming is taught in colleges. Uh, when it comes to machine learning, it is actually totally different. It's slightly different, but you need to understand the fundamental of it so that you understand the field uh, much more. So in machine learning, uh, what we give is, uh, unlike traditional programming, we have the data, which is the core of all the things. Uh, then we provide some learning algorithms to the computer. So computer with the data and learning algorithms, uh, uh, there's a phase called training. So during the training process with the data and the learning algorithms, it actually creates something called models. Okay, That models is what is actually used uh, the next part. Uh, you, you, if it is a language model, you give it a prompt. You prompt something like English language, uh, some question, it gives you an answer. So that is the fundamental difference between a traditional programming I can pause here, uh, uh, but any questions on this part, please, because this is very important to understand uh, the field itself. So any, any con confusion, please ask now. All clear? All right, uh, so again, uh, in the machine learning, the data side is actually the data set. We call it data sets, which is useful training. And the uh, learning algorithms, we will discuss some learning algorithms like KN and KN nearest neighbor support vector machine, distant tree, uh, at least high level. And we'll also deep dive into one or two, uh, which will give you an idea how this, uh, this language is learned. Then our outcome of that, we will, you will get, generate a lot of models. Again, the, at this moment, uh, like very popular are the LLMs, language models, large language models. He, here in this use case, we will only uh, give a very sp specific example. For example, can we create a model which can detect uh, whether a transaction is fraud or not? You are always doing financial transaction, like credit card transaction, online transactions. So uh, whenever a new transaction comes in, can it detect whether it is uh, a fraudulent transaction or a genuine transaction? So something like that of classification, is it possible? That is something that we are trying for uh, for this session today. OK? Uh, yeah, before moving further, uh, as I said, uh, the machine learning is actually, uh, there are three types of machine learning. So one is called supervised uh, learning. Uh, in supervised learning, we actually give you a data set. Okay, this is the data. Uh, for this data, this is the output. Input and output both will be given. And the objective of it is like if you give y and x, which is uh, input and output, uh, it should be able to uh, understand, classify when a new set of data is, uh, a question is asked, it should be able to understand that and say, okay, this is fraudulent, non fraudulent, all these kind of, this is called classification. So uh, a typical example of supervised learning is usually classification. We just need to classify it into one class, whether it's a positive class or a negative class, whether it is genuine, uh, fraudulent, all these things. Uh, regression is something like you, it's able to predict a continuous value. We'll deep dive into what it, each of it, each of this is. Uh, but for just for theory purpose, I am just telling, unsupervised learning is an area which uh, deals with, uh, it does not have any uh, labeled data. Uh, we'll discuss about what is labeled data, unlabeled data. So uh, any unlabeled data uh, training involves that is called unsupervised learning. And again, last one, the uh, reinforcement learning is actually a uh, field of study which deals with uh, like lot of feedbacks. Uh, you do a good thing, uh, you get rewards, rewarded with some points, maybe some rewards. And if you do a wrong thing, you get a penalty. So based on that, machines learn over time. So that is reinforcement learning. 
Uh, this is particularly used for uh, prediction, like uh, autonomous, all kind of control systems and all uh, reinforcement learning is actually very useful. And again, as I said, like we'll be focusing more on the machine learning side and on the supervised learning part. Right. As I said, uh, the uh, types of data used in uh, supervised learning is labeled data. I'll give an example of what is labeled data uh, uh, in, the, in the subsequent session. The types of problems that we are solving is regression as well as classification. Uh, Regression means like we are trying to predict a continuous value. Classification means we just need to classify it into A or B or C. That's it. So that is classification. Right. Algorithms which are very popular in this field are called linear regression, uh, logistic regression, SVM, KNN. Right. What is the aim is actually tries to calculate the outcomes. That is the part. Again, application involves like fraudulent uh, risk, risk, risk evaluation, forecast, sales. All these are actually applications of supervised machine learning. Right. I'll skip here, like unsupervised reinforcement, which is actually a topic for another day. We'll go deep dive into classic ML algorithms alone on the supervised learning side. As I said, like classic ML, algorithm, uh, ML algorithms are actually mini uh, when it comes to the supervised learning. And the most popular and simplest of them is called linear regression. Uh, then there is logistic regression, KNN. Uh, KNN is nothing but K nearest neighbors. Uh, then navy bias uh, classifiers. Then SVMs, decision tree, random forest, data boost. Again, these are just, I'm just giving you a num like names alone. We'll not go into each of these today. We'll be focusing only on two of this, probably KNN as well as distant tree, what it is. Uh, that will be more than uh, enough for a session for understanding what is the nuances of machine learning. Again, uh, but the purpose of this is actually to understand these are the things that is happening uh, in the supervised learning. Right. <laughs> With that, let's deep dive into one of this uh, KNN. KNN is actually nothing but uh, K nearest neighbors algorithm. The basic idea of the algorithm is if something li walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, then it's probably a duck. So how it is done is we have a lot of training records. Uh, for example, this is an image of hen. Uh, this is chicken, hen, chicken. Anyway, anyways, these are ducks. Uh, so uh, when a new image is coming into the picture, it tries to uh, it tries to correlate. Okay, which image is very close to close to the existing training image? If there are more images which are uh, coinciding with the duck category, then probably it's a duck. That is the assumption which takes the KNN algorithm, right? Uh, so how it is done is like for each new image. For example, if it's an image uh, image processing algorithm, it takes the image and checks. Okay, which one is it very close to? How to check uh, if one image is very close to another image? There are uh, there's a uh, there are mathematical uh, calculations involved. Uh, it actually computes the distance between uh, each parameter of an image to the existing characteristic of other training images. That's how it's done internally. Right. So uh, k nearest neighbors is actually uh, the uh, the algorithm which is used in a lot of uh, instant based learning. Uh, example would be uh, any recommendation systems. Okay, for example, you watch a movie today. Uh, a recommendation system can come come up. Okay, uh, what is the new uh, what is the new movie that you might like? These kind of recommendation systems and all uses uh, KNN. Right. How it is done internally is it's actually an instant based learning. Instant based learning means uh, it actually stores the uh, uh, the training records in the form of format like metrics. I think you might have learned uh, the le basics in of algebra in your colleges, schools. So it actually takes all the inputs. OK, for example, movie. Movie has a genre, director, actor, uh, probably like uh, action, romance, all these, right? So all these fields are actually the inputs. And based on that, uh, these are the outputs, which I like. For example, you open Netflix. Open Netflix, and I choose I choose three, three movies. Based on that, it is actually recommending, OK, these might be the movies. In, uh, based on your recommendation, these are the movies. Please choose one. So something like that. So how it is storing is actually in this kind of uh, basic algebra. Uh, it's actually representing everything in a two-dimensional two matrix. Again, it's not two-dimensional. It is actually multi-dimensional. But for simplicity's sake, I am just keeping it two-dimensional. Right. So uh, this is our label data. We have x0 to uh, xn. Uh, similarly, there are m rows. These are the corresponding outputs. For these x, these are the corresponding y. For first row, this is y1, y2, y3. Now, uh, once a model is trained on this kind of data, we ask it to predict. Predict a value, for, uh, say y1, new y1, uh, it will search for what are the similar data points. OK, this new input query, it's actually sim uh, more similar to the fourth one, ninth one, 15th one. Based on that, it will check, OK, these are the classes. 
I have Y Y4, Y9, Y15. Based on that, it will average out and tell you, okay, it is more closer to this one. That's the example that you can see in the right side. So a new instance query is actually asked. It actually checks which is my which are my nearest neighbors. That is the actually the algorithm's name also comes. It uh, if it is three and then for example k is equal to three, that means it's a three nearest neighbor problem. So in this example you can see uh, there are actually three. Uh, it is actually calculating which are which are my closest three neighbors. As you can see there are two uh, triangles which are very close and one square. So it will compare. Okay, based on that I might be a triangle. That is my that is the assumption. So this, these are the training data. This when you plot it in a graph, you will see something like this. So it will check whatever it is the nearest one, and probably there are different uh, met methodologies like averaging out. If you want to create a regression model, you can create a uh, averaging out concept. If you want to classify it, which of these are actually uh, more closer to? For example, here there are two uh, two which are squares. So it can check. Okay, this new instance is probably might be a square, might be a triangle, not a square, because there is only one square nearby. Two of them relates to triangle, so that is the idea. So it actually what it does is it compares new data points to the existing known data points. Right. Let's give, uh, go for a simple data set and example. So uh, I'm working in a, like assume you're working in a uh, construction, uh, not construction, uh, housing domain. Uh, you have like uh, you have a lot of data already from that domain. For example, I have a house which is square feet uh, two thousand. 104 square feet. Uh, it has five bedrooms. Uh, it has one floor. Then it is actually a little older, like 45 uh, years of, or, uh, like uh, it was built 45 years back. Then the price is something around 460. If this is an example, uh, this is the example data set that I have. So uh, if I wanted to, if a new customer comes, a new customer comes and say, okay, I wanted a something like 1,800 square feet. 1,800 square feet, maybe uh, two two room. And one uh, one floor, so uh, and, uh, and probably it might be a little aged also. Maybe 20 years back it should be built. So what? Can, uh, so how can how can I create a model which can predict? Okay, you are you are looking at a price range of something like hundreds of dollars or two hundreds of dollars. So that that regression part is uh, it's called regression. Predicting a value is called regression in machine learning. So uh, for that for that purpose you can use this existing data. Okay, you are looking at 2000. So this might be the very closest one. This is very closest. This is very closest. So there might be some other data. So based on that, it can do an averaging out. Uh, any questions on this data set before I move forward? Is it clear what are we trying to build? Okay. So uh, basically, uh, uh, KNN is actually like that. So uh, some irrelevant data, we are actually cleaning it up. For example, I am only interested in size of the square feet as well as the number of bedrooms. These two are the parameters which actually determines the cost, not the number of floors. It's actually irrelevant. So if such things are there, we only choose what, what features are actually relevant for our prediction part. Then uh, you actually scale this down. For example, usually in all, all the machine learning algorithms, we need to scale all the parameters. It, sh it should not be like one parameter, one column value should be in uh, 10,000 range, other one will be in zero to one range. Then there will be a lot of normalization problems once you create a model. So first things first is like you need to uh, scale it down probably. All these divided by say 10, it will give it will give you in the range of zero to 100 now. So that is normalization. Normalization the process. Uh, we will have an example to explain how it is done uh, in actual coding and all. So if you scale it down, and then uh, then you can see if you, if you are using for example I scaled it down to 50 ranges. Now, if I scale it down, I have three values. Now, when a new customer comes, I want a square feet of, say, suppose this value, uh, then you can actually see which all are my nearest neighbors. In the right side image, you can see there are, there are, uh, there are three neighbors, like 50, 55, and 51. If you average it out, it will give you a new value, like 52. So we can say, OK, for this customer, a uh, new customer comes for a housing domain, you can say, OK, you are actually expecting in a range of like 52, 52,000 or something. Again, this is scaled value. You can scale, unscale it back back to the original value. But the gist of the KNN is actually uh, nearest neighbors. Gist of KNN is actually nearest neighbors and tries to identify which is the which actually matters more for me. Right. Again, the distance uh, distance calculation in KNN is actually done uh, different ways. Uh, Manhattan distance is means okay. 
in the previous example, we have two parameter. This is the X parameter, this is the Y parameter. So what is my distance to X parameter and Y parameter? If you scale it down and then calculate, it is just the absolute values, like X and Y. Uh, but if you want to take the like uh, uh, radial distance between X and Y, you can use, you go for Pythagoras. So this is the Euclidean distance root of, uh, I think you might have learned Pythagoras theorem. So it is just a distance calculation. So how to measure distance and which, which neighbors are very close? These are the different metrics that is available. Uh, I think the area of NLP and all uses another kind of metric called cosine similarity. Again, these are all um, metrics, uh, distance metrics, to identify which is very close to me. Right. So practical use cases of KNN uh, are actually both regression as well as classification. Regression example we saw, it actually predicted a new value. Uh, classification program is like, uh, okay, if it is a class A or class B, uh, for example, I'm trying to create an image model. Uh, I wanted to check whether it is it belongs to a cat, cat or a dog, or maybe some other animal. So that is actually classification problem. We are only trying to classify it into different groups. Regression problems means we are trying to predict a new value. So uh, as you can see, like KNN is used for both regression as well as classification. Like uh, the simplest of recommendation systems you find online, it mostly uses KNN by default. Uh, it's very useful for pattern recognition. Uh, the more use cases are on the financial domains, uh, for example, banks and all. You want to create a uh, bank's stock market, all these and all uh, uses these kind of uh, recommendation systems. Um, again, I, as I said, like, like Netflix movie, you search for a movie, you get a note of reflection. Actually, that is actually very fine-tuned version of KNN. You love that recommendation very more. I have no, not seen a situation you go for searching some movie, you'll get the right recommendations from Netflix. But if you go for something, say, something like Sony Liu, you might be, you, you might be bombarded with a lot of recommendations which are not useful. And eventually what happens, like after 30 minutes, you might quit the app. I don't know whether anything, any, something like this happened for you. But yeah, Netflix and all users are huge. And again, recommendation system in uh, e-commerce sites. For example, you, okay, there is TT bat here. So you search for some TT bats. Uh, what happens, it actually also recommends whatever are related items. For example, probably balls, like uh, uh, maybe TT balls, uh, TT uh, uh, like nets. All these things are actually very closer. So these kind of recommendation systems, uh, KNN algorithms are used in these kind of recommendation systems. Again, uh, that's the end of KNN. Uh, any questions at this moment before I go to the next interesting one? Any questions from the Zoom as well? Like, please post. Okay, ChatGPT is actually de deals with neural network. It's actually very huge data. At that, okay, but again, you can see some patterns of KNN, like nearest neighbors. For example, you ask for a prompt. It is trained, uh, for example, ChatGPT is trained using Stack Overflow. You know that, right? Stack Overflow data. Someone might have asked a similar question, but not exact question, right? So what it does is it actually tries to compare, okay, is there a similar question? Uh, but there is actually similarity. It's not exact question. You can't actually give word for word. So first thing is like it converts the prompt into something like we called vectors. And once the vectors are uh, found, then actually it is actually same. Uh, it's actually tried to find the very nearest one from that. So you can think of like KNN is indirectly used, but again, uh, the actual algorithm in ChatGPT and all is called cosine similarity. It's not actually uh, this kind of distance. Uh, cosine similarity itself is a <laughs> good topic to learn. So you have a data, uh, okay, you have a line, something like X. You have a, another parameter, say Y. So how much line it intercepts on the second one, that is cosine similarity. Like ang hypotenuse you say, right? cos theta of that one, so, and which which cos is actually, which cosine value is actually more similar. That is how ChatGPT works. But yeah, but you get the gist of it. Actually it is uh, underlying, you can think of like, this is a motivation, KN is actually motivation for even, again, cosine similarities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no problem, no problem, just for audience. Please. Mm -hmm. 
right right mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. navi bias is actually probability based uh, so number of words you search for example you are searching for say cricket so cricket is one word uh, that is there so uh, navi bias also you has is actually supervised learning algorithm so uh, all these for example all all the all the cricket related things might be classified under sports right it's actually probability based more on uh, again there are actually um, uh, very several of these algorithms i could not cover everything uh, right navi bias is actually more on the probability statistics side uh, it's actually based on statistics not uh, and then compares which is very close to it okay so right um maybe the knn is kind of advanced uh, it's no no knn is actually different the, these are all algorithms has its own features uh, it's not one one is actually not good over other depends on the use case different approach and right. it's suitable for different use right. cases for recommendation okay. system uh, navi bias is not u- much useful but uh, for uh, for this kind of classification like text classification navi bias is actually very 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 useful text classification okay if it is spam all these for example you can search for some keywords which is actually more oriented to spam kind of emails that is actually very useful for navi bias more than the kn so depends on the use case uh, each algorithm has its own advantages thank you okay all right i don't see any questions on the chat as well so moving on right uh, again the purpose of this today's session is actually to understand some memes uh, which are actually flooding the internet uh, right so you might have seen this knn is actually a good example you might have seen like image classification it tries to detect whether it's a cat or dog and uh, typically the machine learning algorithms actually uh, again it's all it's actually the training error so training errors it can actually predict a wrong wrong thing for example it predicts this cats are actually dogs Uh, again the so the purpose of today's session is also to make you aware of some fun memes so that you go don't go blind uh, to uh, to this kind of memes so you also enjoy this kind of memes again uh, i told about knn so how to confuse knn uh, like machine learning algorithms also there are lot of tutorials so that is another example so that's a breed of uh, dogs called chihuahua so if you give it, a, it it different images of cupcakes with raisins it get confused and get confused all these are actually classified as dogs in case of so all these problems are happening uh, again it's not problems uh, the field is actually a little bit experimental still uh, it would be experimental for a long time it's not a perfect uh, 100 percentage uh, all the time i am pretty sure you might have used chat gpt and it gave you a wrong answer everyone faced it right actually it's an experiment field it's not a like exact science but again there is a lot of scope for improvement every version is actually getting trying to improve over the other previous one so that's the state all right so moving on uh, moving on to the next algorithm that we have for the session is called decision tree again uh, this is a one of the simplest algorithms uh, vis- visually interpretable uh, it's using if else uh, that's the catch it's not a catch but Uh, it uses concepts like entropy information gain uh, to create decision trees uh, like when you whenever you want to take a root node or a any node we try to take your node with the highest information gain i'll talk about that how it is done but uh, this is one fun meme that is totally f- rocking like uh, i built an ai system you look under it it's only if else condition uh, is this a reality or what do you feel anyone face this kind of situation in their projects is it true first of all do you think is it true or false okay okay is it true shweta okay you're in for it's actually the reality uh, it's using if else but again there is there is rules how to use if else it's not like you can uh, row wise like check for if else conditions in a synchronous pattern there is actually pattern involved Uh, to understand the algorithm so today's session like decision tree we will try to understand a classic example so this is an example that i have uh, so i have uh, uh, this is actually from a uh, bank uh, this data set so as you can see uh, bank has lot of information these are actually 10 just 10 rows it will tell you whether a particular individual is actually a homeowner or not 
if it's a homeowner it will say yes if it is not a, if you're not a home if you don't own a home it will say no similarly the marital status the annual income and again banks has already historical information uh, whether this this person has actually borrowed some money and defaulted on it defaulted means they have not repaid the loan that means defaulted so you can see some some of the fields it is actually defaulted uh, row number 8 10 uh, similarly 5 these are the persons which have defaulted uh, i give you some time like try to understand uh, any pattern that you can find out between the columns any relationship that you can find out is there any relationship with uh, defaulted uh, versus home homeowner is there in relationship with marital status is there in relationship with annual income actually machine learning is also like trying to identify some patterns based on that only it generates predictions so whatever machines learn humans can do it much better so is there any any relationship that you can find means they have borrowed some money from the bank but they have uh, not repaid it back that is it. You are then you you become a defaulter. Defaulted, yes. <laughs> this kind of algorithm is actually used in machine uh, like uh, most of companies. Like you apply for a loan, you say okay, you are not eligible, but they will not give you reason because banks has historical data. Okay, like last ten years, this many people used to take money. They have not rebound. Based their personal data is actually this kind of things. Again, I am only limiting it to ten so that you visualize. But again, back to the question, any patterns you can find? Hmm? OK. Hmm? OK, good, good, good learnings. But any other patterns? Hmm? Annual income. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. All those have defaulted is that range. Okay. Right. Like these are good patterns that humans also identify. With this is a very limited data set, only ten rows, so it's very catch, very easy to identify. But assume this is actually twenty rows, uh, twenty column, and there are actually thousand data. You will need an Excel, but still it would be very difficult uh, to identify the patterns, underlying patterns. So uh, decision tree algorithms actually deals with this kind of data. So how it is done is something like, right. So it tries to identify some relationship already. So there are three yeses. Uh, means uh, out of the three yeses, like everything is no. Okay. The homeowner is actually no. That means every homeowner which is yes, they have never defaulted. That is one un one la pattern we can easily identify. <laughs> so that is what it is actually doing here. So uh, it is actually checking uh, homeowner is equal to yes means uh, they have defaulted is equal to no, always. Okay, never no one has uh, ho no homeowners have ever defaulted. That's one learning it identified. Second part, if it is not a homeowner, then out of that it has actually having a mix. Like four of them actually defaulted, three of uh, sorry, three of them already defaulted, four of them did not default. Right, that that is one understanding. Machine will machines will learn uh, in the first first shot. So once that is in, it actually takes the next step. Okay, whoever is actually default, uh, ho it's not a homeowner. Out of that, is there in relation with the next columns? Right. So that's how it is actually the tree is actually getting constructed. As you can see, uh, if the homeowner is actually uh, uh, no. That means uh, they don't have a home, and marital status is either single or default, uh, divorced. That means they have defaulted, right? That is this this first diagram. C uh, diagram C. Again, if it is married, uh, they have defaulted. Uh, again, in this also there are some categories which are actually yes and no. Again, you go to next level, uh, check for annual income. Uh, maybe particular less than 80k, uh, they have not defaulted. More than 80k, they have defaulted. So this is how actually machines tries to understand. This decision tree algorithm is actually an algorithm. As I said, it deals with uh, uh, like some calculations. I'll go to the calculation part, but that will be too boring for a session. Uh, right. So, but it is actually checking which which parameter is actually having a relationship with the other uh, other columns. So how it is done is 
right how it is done is if there is a uh, mix uh, some of it is are uh, dots uh, like zeros some of it as are excess it tries to uh, it tries to split it into two parts basically yes or no based on some some column i'm just giving you some column so the uh, the basic uh, uh, information that we need to focus is we need always need to try to convert it into fully homogeneous systems again that is not possible all the time but our our target is uh, whichever is fully homogeneous because if you try to split it into two and if there is a split which consists of like fully homogeneous systems that is it consists of only one classes then that will be having in the highest information gate we don't need to split it again right because this is a class which all always goes under one particular class for, for example defaulter yes right so that is uh, again this is not always possible so we go for non homogeneous systems also there can be some uh, some minor elements for example this split that you can see here it is having uh, this first set it's actually splitting into two but you can see uh, the majority like five of the excess uh, like cross are in the first set only two dots are here and in the right side you can see there are two crosses but five of them uh, dots are uh, circles are in the right set so this actually helps us to more uh, like classify it into more better better way now we have less things to worry about now we can go for next elements so how it is done is like there is a formula called entropy first we need to calculate entropy uh, okay that is very <laughs> difficult to explain and but this is the formula part again what we need to take is always the information gain node which is actually high to get a information node uh, gain node which is really high you need to take a uh, entropy value which is very low okay so that is how and that's how we predict uh, this kind of trees right as you can see the structure uh, the tree structure d is actually constructed based on this kind of formula now once this is uh, created then it's pretty easy you give a new data for example home owner is equal to yes uh, maybe some other some other single marital status uh, then annual income status it is able to predict okay uh, this person is not bound to bore uh, like default so we can give him a loan that is actually the conference uh, these kind of uh, modern financial systems do actually that is the theory they don't give you if for example you apply for a loan and they still don't give you if it is rejected or not it they give you the status but why it is not there because of these kind of machine learning algorithms to an extent because they still don't know the customer care itself does not know right uh, <clears throat> i'll take a pause here so this is actually the uh, theory part uh we need to first uh, go into the uh, evaluation part then i'll go to the case study so if you create a machine learning model using knn or yeah distant tree you can use any kind of models for a particular use case so how can you evaluate it like which model is better is my knn but as you asked like navy bias you tried one how can you know whether that algorithm works better for that use particular use case we need an evaluation uh, criteria right so evaluation criteria in machine learning is actually done uh, through something called confusion matrix so confusion matrix is actually matrix so if there are actually two classes for example i have a positive class i have a negative class the previous example we saw uh, whether it is a defaulter um, defaulter is equal to yes means that is a positive class defaulter is equal to no means it is a negative class that's a two kind of classification algorithm so in those kind of thing you know what is actuals and what is uh, what is what is actuals you already know now with that state uh, can you create a model and ask it to predict whether it is yes or no positive class or negative class and then you create a matrix out of it how how many of this predicted uh, outcomes are actually true positive uh, the machine predicted something true actually also it is true that means it will come into the first quadrant it is like all these are actually true positives if the machine predicted it false but actually it should have been true then it becomes false negative similarly there is false positive and true negatives also machine also predicted negative uh, actual values also negative so this is actually confusion matrix in the word confusion makes little bit of confusion <laughs> but uh, the what we need to uh, compare is how many of this green uh, true positive and true negatives the machine is able to correctly identify okay uh, the false negatives and false positive are the actually the uh, miscalculation part on the model okay so with uh, this is the confusion matrix i'll talk more on the confusion matrix in the actual example any questions before i jump to the uh, uh, like actual case study here all good with decision tree algorithm what it is doing it is purely if else condition but again not just if else any if else based on some rules uh, identified 
Are clear? Okay. Right. So in this example, let's go for the first uh, data. So I have a data set uh, here. This is actually financial data, transaction data set. Uh, so I have a field called, I, this is actually having 20 uh, columns. Uh, the previous example, we just used two columns, 10 rows and all. So it, has, it is having amount, when is the transaction done, the date, what kind of card type I am using. It's a debit card transaction or prepaid card or debit credit card, all these kind of transaction. Again, what category I try to purchase the transaction, whether it is electronics, groceries, electronics, restaurants, blah, blah, blah. Again, which location it was this credit card used? Is it UK region, Canada region, the device? Again, I have a lot of data uh, on a transaction. Whenever you do a transaction, this kind of data is getting generated behind the hood. Right, but for a customer that might not be important. You might be given a unique transaction ID, that's it. And maybe the status, whether it is successful or not. Right, but uh, behind the hood, banks generate this kind of uh, inferences, like when, not inferences, the actual data, the transaction details, right? So each customer might have a card limit, all this, uh, maybe a credit score. Uh, they might be having some uh, spending frequency also, spending patterns. Maybe some people are actually spending like higher of like $800. Some people are spending less than $500. So this kind of data is getting accumulated in all the banks whenever you use kind of cards, right? Uh, they also know whether there is an on online transaction frequency and all. So uh, uh, be given a past history, okay, these are the uh, okay. This is a data set which actually has thousand rows, uh, twenty column, thousand rows. Now uh, out of that, some of them are actually fraudulent transaction. Fraudulent means it is given as one. If it is a genuine transaction, okay, if I buy something with my credit card, that means uh, I the user used it. Like valid valid transaction, they can be classified as genuine transaction. But if someone gets your card details and do on your behalf, like scam the customers, that is called as fraudulent transaction. Right, all the fraud fraudulent transactions in the data set will be coming as one. Okay, so I have a data set here. Uh, all the transactions that is have historically happened with a particular bank. Then my target is uh, for today's session is like how, how can I create different models using this kind of data set and predict? Okay, I'm uh, a new transaction comes in. Can it predict whether it, this is this is this is high chances of like fraudulent transaction or a genuine transaction? If it's a fraudulent transaction, what typically Indian banks do is they actually give you a call up, call up. They actually call your number. There was a transaction amount of this amount. Uh, they might ask you, okay, so is this done by you? And just to validate the caller, they might ask you, what is your date of birth, name, all these things. These are, these are actually a little bit concerning because uh, customers are also thinking, okay, I don't know whether the person calling is actually from the bank. It can be also scammer. So all these risks post. So how can machine learning help in this kind of thing is, it can actually, based on past transaction, it can actually be able to predict whether the new transaction is fraud or not. So that's what we are trying to do today. So I have, uh, uh, I'm not sure everyone used Jupyter Notebook. Uh, I'm trying to explain everything in a Jupyter Notebook. So I have a Jupyter Notebook uh, notebook here. Uh, this is actually uh, using for the financial transaction data. So first things first, I need to import some libraries to create a machine learning model for the financial transaction. I need to import a lot of libraries. So I'm using particularly Pandas for importing data set and all, Seabone, uh, Seabone, Matplotlib, for all plotting purpose. And again, the main library that I'll be using, uh, this is actually a very popular library. Please do experiment this with this. It's called sklearn. sklearn library has all the popular uh, algorithms, models within it. So it has distant tree classifier. I think we just dis discussed about distant tree. Then logistic regression. These are actually different algorithms. Then Navi bias, Gaussian NB. Then SVM, KN. Neighbors is actually KN. So we'll, we'll, we'll try to create different models and then try to evaluate the performance and then see whether these kind of models can be used in this kind of actual financial transactions, right? So the first thing is like I imported all the data. I need to load the data set to the notebook. So that's what I did. I read the CSV. Uh, the previous Excel sheet is nothing but a CSV. I load it and I just print the data frame. If I print the data frame, it will tell you, okay, there are 20 columns. There are 1,000 entries from 0 to 999. So this is just, just uh, exploring what is the data set about. Okay, nothing fancy. All clear so far? Right. Now next comes is before uh, choosing an algorithm, we need to visualize what, what are we dealing with. 
we cannot blindly use an algorithm uh, on any kind of data set before pre processing we need to scale down some things we need to always we need to first understand the data before before and going into the next steps so that's what we are doing that is called visualization or exploration so we are just printing uh, two uh, rows and you can see there are all the columns uh, all the columns and, for, and limited to two rows so it prints something there is a is fraudulent zero means it's not a fraudulent transaction it's a genuine one one means these are fraudulent transactions any pattern so far can could you identify It's very difficult. Right. Good. Good call. Good catch. That's one. So one thing is you can see online transaction frequency. If it is slow, and then you do online transaction, there is high chance that it is going to be fraudulent. That's a good catch. But that's not the only only pattern. There are other patterns also. We'll come to know how how there is a, some relationship with columns. But this is a one pattern we can quickly identify looking at the data set. Right. Now uh, I have thousand data. Okay, uh, I have thousand data. Not all of them are fraudulent. Not all of them are genuine. Only some portion is uh, fraudulent. Majority of them are uh, genuine, right? So what happens when I? Uh, okay, so let me tell you how it is a situation. So when I try to check the class distribution, uh, I check the last. What are we? What are the target is actually to predict is fraudulent or not? So I try to check. There are actually uh, almost. Eight nine forty seven uh, genuine transactions. Only fifty three of them are actually fraudulent transactions. This is actually a, a typical example of class imbalance because the data set contains majority of the class as genuine, and that is actually the truth. Also, you take any bank example out of thousand transaction, maybe only five percentage of it, maybe less than even five, might be fraudulent. Right? Uh, is there any problem if I try to create a model directly on this data set? What would happen? Uh, do you think? Any model, any algorithms I am going to try. If this kind of with this kind of data set, what happens when I try to create a model and predict? What will what is your what's your thoughts? Will it predict properly, fraudulent? No, oh, why? Data is there, right? Thousand data is good enough data, right? Fraudulent data is less, but that is actually the truth. Fraudulent data is actually less. Not will not be fifty fifty. Real time also, any bank you take. Not 50% of the transaction will be fraudulent. Only 5%. That is the reality we need to accept. But is there any other problems? What what could go wrong here? Right. With this kind of class distribution, if you try to create a model, what happens is model will always predict. Okay, it is non-fraudulent because 95% confidence I can say any transaction is non-fraudulent. So what happens it does is I think I did that actually. I can give you an example. So this is a class imbalance impact I wanted to show before I proceeded. Can you see my screen? Right. So what happened is uh, I tr uh, like took out some data and then tried to create models and then tried to predict. What happens is 95 percentage of it it is actually having good prediction accuracy, like 86 percentage prediction uh, metrics uh, confusion metric showed 86 percentage accuracy. But internally, if you see, did it predict anything on the uh, on the fraudulent? It didn't predict anything. Every every transaction, new incoming transaction, it is classifying it as okay, non-fraudulent, because that is the data it is tra trained. Again, that is actually not machine's problem. Machine only knows what it is given. So first thing first, what we need to fix is uh, this class imbalance problem. I'm going back to the notebook. So if you don't fix this class imbalance problem, machines have a tendency to go for the majority class all the time. Again, that's not machine's problem. It's the data that we are given. All right. So and just keeping in mind, so this is something that we need to fix. It creates a lot of, lot of bias on the machine models. Right. We'll come to that and uh, how to solve the class imbalance. Let's go further. Again, visualization. Uh, what all kind of features are there? There are 20 columns, as I said. Some of them are integer fields. Some of them are float fields. Uh, some of them are objects. Objects means it is actually uh, like, like menu fields. For example, something is prepaid card, something is credit card, debit card. It's actually not number. It's actually just string values, right? So machines do well if it is actually number based. So first thing is first, we just need to first first print. Uh, 
is there any uh, numerical features is there any categorical features numerical features means it is actually integer field or new floating field categorical features means like as i said the card types card types are actually categorical it is actually having categories uh, or uh, like merchant types is it electronic grocery all these kind of things so uh, first uh, what i am doing like trying to explore is what are all the numerical fields i am trying to select types which are of float integer categories and again categorical types i am trying to select into object types and then i am floating some uh, information again this is actually just uh, uh, th this is actually the most time which any data scientist would do data processing pre processing part actually 90% of the time is actually cleaning up the data they call it washing cleaning all this actually 90% of the time is actually done here because this is the most important step also if you miss here or mess up something here the models will behave very 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 different you will not understand what it is again so what i am doing is a lot of exploration okay what are the kinds of data is the data all amount data is it all ranged in 175 to 125 ranges so i'm just plotting some histograms uh, and i'm trying to create some box plots again this are actually trying to identify what is the variation uh, this box plot actually reveals something very interesting you can see the customer income customer income is actually in the range of like 1 lakh plus 1 lakh or 80000 ranges but uh, you can see like other fields like count and all it might be coming uh, in like 0 to 1 range so there is lot of uh, like skewiness in the data itself you need to first of all normalize it into all the same state right uh, then after that what i did is i just checked with the categorical features is that equal for example card types card types are actually only three types again you can see debit prepaid credit all are balanced data all are out of 1000 all ranges in 300 ranges if prepaid is actually debit is very less what what can be done means uh, debit debit card transactions are very less then we again need to boost up something or like reduce the other one at, at the at the end what we are trying to do is we need to create uh, create a datas create datasets which are almost equal equally balanced right so this is actually this this dataset example is actually very balanced dataset uh, only except the fraudulent transactions part except the class imbalance remaining features are all balanced most of it can see like category type merchant categories are all all in the range of like one one around 150 ranges pretty much balanced okay uh, like how is the where where the device was used where the transaction is it from the desktop is it from the mobile is it on a point of sales machine all these things all are pretty much balanced okay now uh, next thing what uh, you try to visualize what it is the data next thing is how is there any correlation with the target field is there any 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 column which has a strong correlation with the uh, for example sweta uh, correctly identified one pattern if the customer is actually having a less uh, online presence they are bound uh, they are bound uh, to for a like fraudulent transaction that's actually a very good uh, pattern so uh, to identify such patterns there is a matrix called correlation matrix so that's what i try to print here as you can see it's a square matrix to cross to against each column so you can see here okay there is something called zero here if you go and see here the amount column amount column has zero, zero correlation with each fraudulent column means uh, all fraudulent transactions or genuine transaction has no correlation with the amount field you understand means uh, whatever is the amount that cannot determine whether it's a fraudulent or not simple simple terms because it has zero correlation there are same amount which are actually fraudulent as well as same amounts which are genuine right so this correlation matrix actually helps us reveal some more things about the data this amount column has no relationship whether it is fraudulent so we can actually skip those column why to create that extra baggage it does not provide any value right so this field this is one one column which we can drop again apart from that there is another column called uh, unnamed not sure whether you observed that what is the first column first column is called unnamed of zero but what does it do it just gives you the serial number 0123 up to 999 okay is that any any useful for prediction models no that's just a serial number it does not have it has a zero correlation by looking at the data itself you should understand okay this might not have okay what happens if you put serial numbers 
assuming if your data is actually balanced in such a way that all the even numbers are actually fraudulent, all the odd numbers are non-fraudulent, you could try to create a model with that. There's a strong bias on the machine learning. Okay, all the even numbers are actually fraud. That is actually wrong, right? So again, unwanted things also we should remove. So this, this data set has actually feel, feel called unnamed or zero. That is nothing but a serial number. Serial number does not have any relationship with whether a transaction is fraudulent or not. So those columns and all we can remove. So that's what we did after the correlation metrics. Right. So uh, like correlation metrics say that amount feature uh, could be ignored. has co zero correlation with the amount feature. Uh, fraudulent transaction, no correlation, zero correlation. Right. Then what happens? Unnamed zero date. These are all uh, negligible, either having correlation of 0 0.01, very less. Some, some fields has very less correlation. Again, it's up to you whether you want to drop those columns because it does not provide any significant information for the machine. So it's up to you, but for now I am keeping every data. I'm only removing which has zero correlation. And also I don't want one column which is called serial number. So I removed the unnamed column also. But if you see the pattern, unnamed columns, serial number column has actually negative 0 0.01 correlation. Again, I don't want that, uh, that bias to creep in for the models. So that's, what, that's the reason I removed that model. Right. Now, now comes the data processing. At this moment, till this moment, we were only exploring the data, visualizing what is the data set about. This comes the important part called pre-processing and cleaning. Different terminologies like washing, uh, modifying, like uh, updation, all these things happening in the pre-processing stage. So first things, as a dev, what will you do? What are the null checks? Null points are actually the curse of all devs. There are actually uh, frameworks to avoid null pointers. So if any of these columns has null data, it can throw a null pointer exception. Again, not null pointer exception in uh, particularly this um, coming to AI, but again, those are actually uh, very important things that we should clean up. So first of all, we need to check, is there any null across any of the columns or any of the rows? If there is null, we need to address that. Maybe probably provide it as suitable data. Either I can re remove that entire row. That's also fine. So first of all, we need to check any nulls. Apart from null data, right? Missing values. Some columns might not have a credit card type or the region because the bank could, could not get it for some reason. So these kind of databases have some missing values. So all these things we just need to clean up. So these are all, these are the steps involved in the pre-processing part. So I just check if there are any not applicable values, like empty values, missing values. After that, what I did is I wanted to convert all the uh, categorical features to numbers. For example, prepaid card. Uh, and the card types are actually three types. I have debit card, prepaid card, and credit card. I just want numbers. So maybe prepaid card can be zero. Uh, credit card can be one. If it is number wise, uh, the machines actually can do it much better rather than it is string values or categories. So I'm using some label encoders to convert this uh, categorical values to, uh, to something like uh, numerical values. I'm just giving it a number. So I'm converting all the categories to numbers, equivalent numbers. Then I am trying to plot. So in the previous plot you, could say, you would have seen, I have very less fields because previous box plot only showed There was some question, sorry. Uh, right, Pre previous box plot only showed numerical features. Now, once I converted the uh, categorical features also to numerical features, I have a box plot of many, 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 many features, which is good, more, more the merrier. Now, after that, what, uh, what we need to do is, we need to drop some, as I said, some columns does not pose any, any significant value for the prediction part. For example, the unnamed zero, that is just a serial number. Serial number does not uh, provide any for example, unique transaction number. If there is a column called unique transaction number. Even though if it is 16 digit, it doesn't pose. It's actually a randomly generated number. Why to carry that baggage uh, for the model? So we can drop those uh, those fields which are not used. Again, after that, what I did is we need to change the skewiness. Again, going back here, you can see some date, uh, some values are in the range of like one lakh, uh, one lakh plus, but some are in the range of like zero to hundreds, maybe zero to one, zero to two all this. So we just need to approximately scale it. So we are, I'm using min and max scalers here to convert it into, and uh, converting it into equal fields. Now after scaling, if I try to print a box plot, now it's actually little better. You can see the, the lowest values range from 
Okay, so this is field. The date field I converted into, which was a categorical co column, I converted into numbers, and that numbers I scaled it down. I scaled it down to zero to one range. All the columns are now scaled into zero to one range. Now it's pretty easy to visualize also. All the uh, averages are actually lying around 0 0.5, which is also good, right? Now machines can actually learn much better. We are making the lives of machines also better. Actually, uh, whoever is doing this is called data scientist field. They actually spend more time on the data processing side, pre-processing part. That's actually the most important. I'll tell you later part. Hmm? Right. That we can do, but again, that's not recommended uh, unless you know what you're doing. Because if you particularly sure that you can do it, that's not a harm. Uh, again, um, recommended way is actually scale everything to a same range. Machines will be able to understand, okay, this has more correlation. Probably say card type has more correlation. Machines will understand different algorithms. It is actually not using the actual values. For example, decision tree algorithm. It has amount column, right? And the previous one, we showed one amount column, sorry, not amount column, uh, the actual cost value. If it's a defaulter or not, the annual income column was actually very high. Did it use the actual income column only at the last node it used, whether it is having high, higher than 80K or less than 80K, right? So it does not matter if you scale it up. Most of the algorithms will actually uh, like remove that part, uh, but you can do that. There are algorithms which can, uh, with, with which we can give more weightage also. But again, not recommended. This is actually a comparison session, not actually fine tuning part. Right. So as you can see, like, now the box plot is actually evenly balanced. All the skewiness has been removed. All the values are in 0 to 1 range. And the median values lies almost in the 0 0.5 range. OK? Right. Now what happens? Now parts. Now starts the model building part. As I said, uh, OK, before creating the model, uh, uh, OK, if I am using this entire 1,000 data for model building purpose, how can I uh, evaluate? How can I compare? Uh, and I using this 1,000 data, I created different, different models. Say KNN algorithm model, maybe decision tree algorithm model, maybe SVM model, all these models I'm creating. What happens when, OK, how can you check whether which model is better? All the data is used for training purpose, right? You only have 1,000 data. You can, you can ask the bank for additional data, but that's again wrong. Then there is no point, right? You can actually you can't actually tell. Okay, already machine learned using some data. What is the purpose? Is like you need to see uh, have some unseen data by the machine and check whether machines are actually predicting properly or not. That's the target, right? So if you are if you are creating a model uh, with some training data and the train same training data is used for testing purpose, it might actually go a better results. But is that the actual results? No, right? So we'll need to take out some data from this data. And the remaining part, you can use it for training purpose. So some part, you are keeping it aside for testing purpose. That's what I am doing it here on the model. Uh, right. So what I am doing is I am trying to split it into 80. So out of that 1,000 data, I am trying to split it into 80. 80% 80 of that is for training purpose. 20% I am taking it out for testing purpose. Now, uh, with 80% of the data, that is 800 rows of data, I create a model. Now, uh, I can check the performance of that model using this 20 remaining 20% 20 of the data and check with which model is actually comparing like comparing, comparing the different models, which, per, which model is actually performing better. So that is the purpose of it. I try to split it into 80-20, and also I try to split it into 70-30. Just need to compare. Is there any, uh, that's it. So what I did is I tried to split uh, seventy percent of data to one side. Now I got these kind of uh, inputs. Again, I missed one point. Uh, do you remember? Like I said, like class distribution has this problem. I showed you in diagram. If you don't solve the class uh, class imbalance, uh, what happens? Machines will always predict uh, everything to be non-fraudulent, genuine transaction, right? So that is something that we need to fix first. And that was actually missed. Sorry, I'll cover that as well. Right. 
so class and data imbalance data imbalance needs to like there is a majority class of 95 percentage genuine five percentage transact so what that is what i tried to fix here there is actually uh, uh, techniques like resampling either you can actually let me go back to the data uh, diagram right either you can actually remove uh, this much data out of the picture then only take this much data okay so then it becomes more equal right we need to resample it basically there is actually a lot of data uh, like majority class is actually falling on this range either you can actually multi duplicate this data multiple times such that this is also equal to this that is called oversampling the minority class or otherwise you can do uh, uh, resampling uh, like undersampling of the majority class you can cut short the data and also make it equal if it's both equal then the machine has equal chance okay it can predict zero as well as it can predict one right so that is what we try to fix here uh, resampling right so i'm using a library called smode so it actually resamples uh, the uh, uh, this class imbalance problems so minority class it's actually resampling it much higher so if it is a really 53 uh, 53 rows or 50 rows uh, which are actually uh, fraudulent i am trying to uh, replicate that uh, minority class again another 1000 times so both of them are actually balanced. So that is why you can see here the last column. This is the last column is the is fraudulent part. It's actually evenly balanced now. It is having 50% uh, fraudulent, 50% uh, genuine, non-fraudulent. Right. Now after that, uh, if you try to uh, create this kind of uh, models, so there is actually an algorithm called logistic regression uh, model. Uh, creation of models is actually very simple. Uh, uh, in actually uh, this, using this SKLN library. If you try to create a model uh, uh, grid search, sorry, not grid search, you can go for decision tree, which is easy, very easier. So you just instantiate a decision tree classifier instance, uh, call the method called dot fit with the training data. And this is the X, X training part, and this is the Y training part. If you give it that data, it will do the uh, uh, model training. So once this model is trained, this model, uh, this decision tree classifier 80 20 split this model can be used for prediction purpose how to use for prediction i can show you yeah there's a method called dot fit dot fit is a method for uh, training purpose once it is trained you can use the remaining uh, test data to predict to predict so once you predict you get the predicted values you also have the actual values uh, what did we learn on the previous performance part? Anyone remember the metrics part name? Right. So we are trying to, what we are doing, trying to do is, we are trying to create a confusion matrix. So confusion matrix will tell you, okay, how is this model? So you can see here, uh, this conf this matrix actually, uh, uh, performance of this decision tree is actually 87 percentage. Means it's able to, 87 percentage of the times, it's able to identify properly whether it is a genuine or fraudulent. And again, if you try to dig deeper, it will say, okay, uh, genuine transaction, it predicted properly with 90% confidence. Uh, fraudulent transactions, it predicted with 85% confidence. This is called precision. Sorry, 90% uh, confidence. Again, this both are 90% here. This, I do not sure whether you forgot. Uh, right. What are we trying to do is true positive and true negatives. Okay. So that is this metrics about. So based on that, we are able to get some uh, numbers. Okay, what is the accuracy part? There are actually parameters like F1 score, uh, the recall. Again, these are actually nuances just for purpose. Uh, I'm not going into the calculation how it is done here because that will take more time. Right, so confusion metrics I was able to plot. You can, you can see 161 of it actually predicted true false, uh, like true positives. 171 of it is true negatives. All this it is able to predict properly. Only very less percentage it's able to uh, incorrectly predict it, whether it is true or false. Right, then, so that is the state of uh, decision tree model. So here I have a uh, model built using decision tree. So this was actually built using decision tree classifier. This is the algorithm that was used. And with using that, I created a model. And after that, I used it to predict. That predicted data, I just created a confusion matrix. Right. Uh, along with this, there are actually other kinds of uh, models also, uh, like SV, uh, SVM, then Navi bias. All these we can, uh, there are actually uh, libraries available. SKLearn libraries provide these kind of functions. 
using those, uh, you can create your own models. Like, it's actually generally available. Do play around with it if you have not done already. So you can create your own models and then try to train it using the dot fit method. And once the dot fit, uh, once the training is done, you can actually try to predict uh, predict uh, the output. Uh, again, prediction uh, prediction part we are using the test data. We already split the current data set into training data and test data. Test data is actually unseen data, and based on that, we can actually predict some metrics. I can go to the last and show you what all are the numbers. For example, uh, I can see here. Uh, the misclassification rate for a, this is actually the uh, accuracy rates and all we can see, right? This having, random forest is having 96 percentage accuracy. Random forest, Adaboost and all is actually very good algorithms. Uh, SVM also. So it is actually having really good numbers. So with 95% or 97% of the confidence, you can say, okay, the, my model is actually performing this higher. Uh, is it possible to, Im again, impro improve it further? Any ideas like how we can improve it further? Like it's an open question. Is it possible or do you think any any ways we can boost up this data, like performance? Right. There's an area called uh, hyperparameter tuning. I skipped that part because that itself takes more time to explain. So there is an area called, uh, where is that? Uh, it's called hyperparameter tuning. So we can actually fine tune it much further. So previously before fine tuning, I was actually able to only get a score of 91 percentage for Adabu standard. But after fine tuning, I did a step in between. I just skipped it. There are actually steps like hyperparameter tuning. So these are, uh, it's actually searched for more, uh, each algorithm does the hyperparameter tuning its own way. This, for example, this entry and all, it actually tries to uh, improve the it search for search for which parameter is more better so all these things with using this hyperparameter tuning i was say at the end i was actually able to uh, you can see numbers here for knn it actually increased 2% 77 to 79 96 to 98 uh, so yeah 3% and all for adaboost algorithms it was using again at this moment i'll pause I'll like stop here the purpose of this session is not to go in depth and teach you on hyperparameter tuning and all, but this is actually a like starting point uh, just to give, uh, take the curiosity part for you. Like what all are the algorithms available in the machine learning models, how it is working, how it is designed, all this part. And like how is it performing? Like every, anything needs to be evaluated at the end. So how is the evaluation parameter at the end? Again, for that kind of metrics only, this session is intended for. So with that, I will go to our slides. Right. So I think we covered the fraud detection part. So if that model, if I deploy it into a cloud service or some machines, any new real-time data, any new financial transaction is happening, it will be able to predict with how much confidence. Is it actually fraudulent transaction? If it's a fraudulent transaction, they can actually get it confirmed by giving a call. Instead of calling all the time, okay, the moment you do a transaction, they will, customer care agent will bother you, right? So all these things could be avoided. Actually, it's, it's to make the uh, uh, the life of customers, like a better user experience for customers. So these kind of use cases are very, very popular and do try it out, especially with the Indian banks. I don't think they are still there yet. Right. Right. Uh, this is a historical information. Uh, I told you before when, uh, is it possible to improve the performance beyond a point? Uh, actually, classical machine learning algorithms is actually covered in the red line. So classical machine learning algorithms can only uh, uh, cover to some point. More than that, uh, it needs like higher de training data set. Again, if you go for a one trillion data set and use decision tree algorithm, that will be the <laughs> end of your machine also. It will have nodes, trees, that much depth, and it will, it will give you a very poor performance. You should never use a decision tree algorithm on one million data. Or something like that. Again, these are actually very small. Uh, classical machine learning algorithms are only very useful for, for a particular amount of data. As the data increases, uh, for example, now I, we show, showed an example of 1,000 data. If it increases beyond like 10,000 or 1 lakh, never go for uh, uh, classical machine learning. You need to go for higher level, like deep learning, uh, like neural networks and all. So uh, this is actually a historical example, like how the performance uh, goes for higher data sets. Uh, right. So I think uh, nowadays, I think everyone is interested in the large language models. 
large language large neural networks like la language models and all deal in this kind of thing it is having performance like higher of 90% 95% 99% and all again this is actually just food for thought i am not going to teach anything about the neural nets or deep learning in this session right i think that with that i think uh, i'll stop the session and i am opening for any questions like for uh, question and answer so any questions so far what we learned we explained about like a lot of supervised learning algorithms what all are the performance for this particular financial transaction uh, requirement any questions post now right right smart right right so what it is doing is it's, it actually tries to identify for example this example in this example you can see only 3s right uh, like 5 uh, 7 uh, 5 8 and 10 only 3s s uh, yes fields are there that means only 30 percentage remaining 70 percentage are no now if you uh, what you need to do, do is either create multiple uh, yes fields you can duplicate this field another three more times what happens uh, okay all these fields uh, three yes fields if you duplicate into two times the data set will go like 13 but uh, out of 13 uh, 50 percentage like almost six are actually uh, no that is one way that is oversampling the minority class that is what actually smote is doing smote is not exactly doing the sampling side that itself is a very uh, field of study how to uh, instead of creating exact data uh, like slightly change for example change it to 81 does it impact it also checks like that and then it checks because what happens if you try to exactly place it there is every every training data is actually seen by the model and you try to separate the test and training data this data consists of all the fraudulent within the training data also so smart and all uh, does this uh, it actually tries to uh, create multiple instances but there is will be subtle uh, variations not exact but uh, subtle variation which does not impact the outcome got it uh, again uh, we can either do two ways o resampling can be done either oversampling the minority class or undersampling the majority class we can also remove like uh, three nos if you remove three nos there are remaining six data sets three of them are yes three of them are no which is also good for good candidate for machine learning models yeah 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 person match uh, sorry okay hmm. exact match see this is not exact science this is still an experimental field so ex learning okay uh, it will be definitely supervised learning because you already have some data label data this is actually a known person right for example there is a person for say xyc uh, with this location all this all this data is already there uh, and it is already labeled if it is labeled then it comes under a supervised learning category if it is unlabeled we don't know we just have some data for example i'm just giving an example okay theoretically you are all college students uh, you are having uh, marks in your final exam uh, you wanted like your teacher wants to uh, give like uh, first 50 percentage of uh, first of all they wanted to cat cluster it cluster it means uh, some uh, cluster some people on one side maybe you will not get equal marks in all the subjects for example maths paper i'm just taking an example maths paper you get 90 percentage uh, maybe some other statistics paper you might get 50 percentage but the total if you use only the total you will not be able to provide a grade right uh, for example if you want to give a grade grading mechanism first of all you need to cluster each person into different different categories that is unlabeled those kind of unlabeled data you go for uh, non supervised learning 
but in your your use case is actually labeled so you go for learning but again any of this algorithms i don't think it will be more recommended because that is an exact match it requires the exact match no variation right maybe pan card Okay, is there any existing match? Exactly. Okay, I'm just uh, rephrasing this question. You wanted to create a new user, uh, sign up a new user, uh, but it's using a different email ID. Only the email ID previously was a uh, unique, but all the remaining data, for example, the name, phone numbers, everything might be matching. So if you wanted to identify a new user based on existing data, go for supervised learning also. Yeah, for that, it's actually not an ML use case also. It's actually rule-based, right? That is also what Abdul is saying. You don't need a. Uh, Okay, uh, it's not an exact, okay, what your problem is, it's not an exact details. Exact details, you go for Navi bias, so that will be probability based. How much is the match? Probability based would be a good candidate, but that is not purely an ML use case. If you are not able to figure out like traditional ways, then only go for, you, do, you should not retrofit ML use case algorithms for a traditional problem. Traditional problem you can solve via simple rules, conditions, should go for that all the time. But if it is not possible, you need some kind of pattern recognition, all this, then definitely go for this kind of algorithms. Now, we bias and all is purely probability based. It's actually very good for, I think you tried the word matching, right? Word matching and all is actually really good in Navi bias. Okay. Probably we need to experiment and try. Again, this is an experimental field. You can experiment and see, is there any significant improvements? Still, good, good. without that also, you can try. Is there any advantage over the other? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, okay, so uh, if I go back to the previous session, this session is more on the, uh, yeah, more on the machine learning aspects of it. Uh, when you say like a uh, huge data, again, if you're going a beyond 10,000 rows or 10,000 fields parameter, then you're actually knocking the doors of deep, deep learning. You are actually trying to think of like neural nets. Neural nets is actually a field of deep learning. So you will need to always go for uh, neural nets or deep learning algorithms uh, so this traditional uh, ML models is actually not a very good candidate. I think last slide, performance side, right? If you keep increasing the data, for example, financial fraud transaction, you keep in increasing, there is one point after that, there is not much improvement. You give it a 1 million trillion record, it will give you the same input like 1,000 records. So that is not the purpose of traditional machine learning. Again, traditional machine learning was a starting point to understand how we can uh, create large models. So this is actually the fundamental part. This is not useful for large models that I can give you confidently say. Never use uh, traditional models if your data is huge. But you will see a lot of patterns uh, still used in neural networks. You need to identify like what is neuron. Uh, neural nets is actually a different topic. If you're interested, I can take one more session, but that is, hmm, that is actually a vast area. And it's also very difficult to cover, explain anything in one session. But let's try maybe one or two sessions. Right, and just uh, for the sake of Selvendran uh, Rengaraj, who asked this question, uh, actual traditional, uh, that's a good question, Lama 3 model, which came out recently from Meta, that is actually having 8 billion parameter model as well as a 70 million parameter model. 
that is actually not a candidate at all so these are actually generic models you ask anything under the sun you can ask it in english language it's using nlp behind the hood and there is a concept like vectorization all this so it's actually using those kind of learnings and again it's not trained on i train my notebook in my machine which is having actually the worst gpu right but if you try to create a, a machine learning uh, like neural nets again i can create neural nets like up to like 10000 maybe not more billions of data you need actually sophisticated environment you will be constrained with the resources uh, for example this i am just giving a hypothetical number not a hypothetical number, actual number lama 3 model which uh, meta released recently it was trained on 40000 gpus 40000 gpus running i don't know how long i am guessing in it will train it will use the training for months together so 40000 gpus they are running parallelly they are sharing the knowledge what is the gradient between each models and then uh, then trying to consolidate then train and again it's not like this machine learning model will run in under uh, under 1 minute if i tried running the jupyter notebook that machine learning uh, that learning model uh, which lama 3 was designed it was running for months not just days right right running time also see once the model is created then model cannot i cannot uh, download the lama 3 model in my machine it will not run i have tried also <laughs> so lama 3 model and all if you want to run you need actually higher higher resource machines you can go for collabs uh, which has like an, and add 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 more resources to that then it will run lama 3 again for model training part that is the more crucial, crucial part here we are using just one fit function uh, model training part it will takes not just days or weeks it will trace takes months so i think the 80 i am guessing it will now take like this few months like 3 4 months to create that model uh, running every day Yeah, running across distributed system, parallel computing, all sharing resources. That itself is a vast topic. I'm sorry, I'm going to cut. Right. Right. So nowadays, uh, okay, that depends on what kind of large model, like language, uh, language models. Right. Right. So uh, the training data is also running in trillions. For example, ChatGPT. ChatGPT. The source of the data is actually Stack Overflow. you have used stack overflow right you are familiar with right that was actually a uh, survey system uh, you ask for a question uh, you get an answer so all these it had this kind of labeled data already uh, for this question this was the perfect answer now it was trained on these kind of, uh, in large language models it first consists of like unsupervised learning it tries to convert it tries to create some random model once the model is actually prom- promising you will actually fine tune it using supervised learning algorithms again not this supervised during new, neural net or neural network algorithms so there is an idea called right neural networks is actually an another area which itself is a vast area i cannot uh, go details into that but neural networks is actually using uh, these neural net which is actually supervised learning using that it is actually trained it's trained for months together as i said did that answer your question no fine tuning see uh, language models has actually a different concept uh, rather than this kind of use case it's actually transformers it's actually converting the language um, without miss first the language whatever you type in that english prompt text is actually converted into vector and once this vector it tries to match uh, what is the most closer vector for me so using that closer vector it tries to again w- how it is trying to identify the closeness is actually cosine similarity it tries to check the cosine similarity which which uh, question or answer was actually more suiting and then once the suitable vector is identified it tries to de vectorize uh, that vector is actually converted back to the english language and that is the output that you are getting that is the flow i think i'm not sure there was a session last time multilingual chat support that is actually covered what is the fundamentals of language models uh, in depth that is a little bit of a vast topic so that is how it is happening transformer models it's actually using lot of nlp and nlp is also another vast topic i can take so yeah different problem okay uh what about the future of unstructured data right uh, <laughs> that is a good question actually uh, this all these language models uh, this large language models are using unstructured uh, way of uh, uh, like uh, super unstructured way of learning that is uh, non supervised learning first they are actually trying to uh, most of this data are actually getting converted i think that is one of the reasons 
might have seen there is a lot of demand for data engineers again in our company also there are a lot of data accumulated over the years so uh, we showed one example here right uh, this kind of data set uh, many customers in many bank customers if i ask them can can you give me a data set like this what happens is uh, they will say okay i have amount data transaction data i have card type category type all this but i don't have whether uh, that customer is a frequent transaction maybe that data occupies in some other machine maybe some other database that is not connected to the current database so all this uh, data they need to first accumulate this on all this unstructured data they need to accumulate that is one of the reasons why data engineers are actually more in demand all the companies are actually trying to go get into ai but that is not possible so first of all they need to like this all this unstructured data they need to classify get it labeled so that is the first part uh, again a uh, lot of apache spark uh, then i think hadoop all these are actually more used in data etl yeah, like i'm not sure whether you are term extract transform load these kind of things right so all these things are actually uh, more in demand because of that reason they need to collect all the data under one foot which is actually queryable once it is queryable then they can use ai algorithms all all kinds of algorithms on top of that but because of this because of this all the companies are actually stuck and that's the reason okay i think i hope to answer sorry for cut off cutting off uh, because uh, it's already 20 25 minutes passed out uh, yeah i believe it's an interesting session and there might be a lot of questions and uh, more discussions that we need to have in this topic yeah so this geek night is not also not an uh, like a one day session or one thing right so it's going to be recurring uh, so every month we will have a session on geek, uh, like uh, this event so uh, yeah we will have a lot of follow ups with similar topics like on the aml and other stuffs which are uh, the recent uh, technologies that are coming in uh, so we expect more participants uh, yeah i think uh, uh, last time as well right so la from last month we have resumed this event again uh there was a small gap uh, which we had uh, but uh, yeah from last month we had a uh, resume this and uh, uh, since we are hosting this in webinar as well most many of the participants has joined in webinar session as well uh, i thank all of the participants who have uh, come here and uh, had a wonderful discussions over this topic expecting more people to come on premise so that we have will have a lot of connects uh, different topics different ideas many more things to come in so please come into office and uh, let's have a connect here thank you thank you all for joining and deepak special thanks to you for uh, taking the session and uh, delivering a very uh, key notes on the deep uh, learning and uh, other stuffs thanks for uh, signing up